This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today we present the first half of a lecture by Lehman Brightman, head of Native American Studies at the University of California at Berkeley and president of United Native Americans. Mr. Brightman will speak on alternatives to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This is the fourth of a series of programs recorded at Iowa State University's National Affairs Institute devoted to the American Indian. Part two of Mr. Brightman's talk can be heard next week at this time. It's a pleasure to be here. I've never been in Iowa before to give a talk or to see any of the people in this state. It's colder than the devil out here. <laughs> I, uh, I understand you had a Bureau of Indian Affairs employee that spoke today. That's nice because you should hear what the Bureau of Indian Affairs has been doing for Indian people for the last hundred and some odd years. As you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was formed in 1824. And at the time it was formed, it was within the War Department. The War Department stated that the reason they should have the Indian Department is because they were there to protect Indians as well as to protect white people, or I should say non-Indians. Also, another reason they gave for establishing the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the War Department was that most of your early settlements near Indian Territory were army posts. So this is the reason they established the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the War Department. It remained within the War Department up until 1849 when they moved it into the Interior Department where it remains today. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is run by what they call a Commissioner of Indian Affairs. He was appointed so in 1832. Up till the time they received the commissioner, there were three employees, the head of the bureau, one assistant, and a chief clerk. And they had the bureau, uh, Indian Territory, or the United States, divided up into what they say, three, ter uh, three divisions, Northern Division, Southern Division, and the Middle Division. I'm gonna give you kind of a little history lesson here. I didn't know what I was supposed to speak on, so I just, I know that none of you Caucasians, and you blacks, and Asians, and none of you other people know a damn thing about Indians. And I'm an expert on them, because I'm an Indian. We've got a lot of anthropologists running around who are experts, a bunch of sociologists, and some historians. But a funny thing about it, when you read history, you find about, I should say the only time you find anything about Indians, it's either derogatory or fiction. Most of our historians who've written these history books and history texts and so forth, they haven't been able to break away from their Anglo-Saxon race consciousness enough to write an objective textbook you would think that Indians just suddenly appeared here within about the last 20 years when the poverty programs came in. That's when you suddenly discovered there were Indians here, except when you watch TV or the movies. And then when you see something in television or the movies, we're either depicted as some savage who runs around raping and shooting and killing innocent white women and children, raiding wagon trains. About the only damn thing you non-Indians know about Indians is that we raided wagon trains in a circle. We had to attack, we had to attack in a circle. And we don't attack after darkness. I've attacked quite a few people at night, mostly females. <laughs> but it's neither here nor there. But I thought possibly we'd just get into kind of a little basic history lesson here. I founded the Indian Studies Department at the University of California. I'm a lecturer there. I teach a course called the Native American and Contemporary Society. I teach another course called the Territorial Expansion Policy of the United States and its effect on Indians, how they fought Indians and drew up treaties. And they told us, as long as the grass grows, the water flows, and the sun shines, this land will remain yours until the Territorial Expansion Policy pushed a little further westward. And then we had another battle. We'd defend our homelands. You'd bring in the cavalry. Eventually, we would be defeated. I have to give up. And then we'd sign another treaty, and you'd move over a little further westward. Until finally, you got all of our land, with the exception of about 56 million acres that we own today. And incidentally, the Soil Conservation came in a few years back and did a survey of the land that we own, the 56 million acres. They found out that 14 million acres is critically eroded. 
that 17 million acres was judged severely eroded, and 25 million acres was judged slightly eroded, which means we're the proud owners of 56 million acres of erosion. That's what you've left us, 56 million acres of erosion. And just recently, they sent a survey team out. They're always doing surveys on Indians, and they did another survey on the water situation on Indian reservations. And they surveyed 22 different Indian reservations. And on all 22 reservations, the water situation was terrible. The water was found to be contaminated to the degree of 80 to 100 percent on all 22 reservations. And over 70 percent of this contaminated drinking water was carried for a mile or more. And they obtained this water from irrigation ditches, polluted ponds and streams and rivers. And you read today where they're dumping mercury from these factories and so forth, pesticides, DDT, they're dumping it on crops and so forth, it rains, it washes it down into the tributaries and the little streams and what have you, and they go into the major rivers and they go into the seas. In California out there, you read every day where the salmon is so polluted with mercury and DDT, they have, it's not fit for human consumption. You read where eagles out there can no longer reproduce because their eggshells are so thin, they crack, and we're in jeopardy of losing our eagles and some of the other major birds. This is something that has never been brought out. I am one of the Indian people who, we were ecologists long before you non-Indians ever thought of this. We never tried to kill off the different animals and what have you, except just enough to eat and so forth. You people have done a marvelous job since you got here. You've managed to pollute the rivers, the streams, the air. What you haven't polluted, you shit on. You're like seagulls. You're not shitting, you're squawking. I use a few adjectives and adverbs in my conversation because I have an inadequate vocabulary. So I make up for it for this. And for you Indian people out there, don't be insulted because there are no cuss words in Indian. They're all English. And you English professors sitting out there, you all may, if you haven't heard this, you might learn something. I'm not cussing. I intend to cuss a little bit during this. And I'm not cussing to offend any of you, some of you religious fanatics sitting out there. But nevertheless, it's just part of my makeup. I was born on a reservation in South Dakota. I'm a Sioux Indian and Creek Indian. I grew up the hard way. I lived in a worst section of town. My father was a bootlegger. I had to fight my damn way for everything I've got, not that I have anything. I got my college education by playing football. So I'm an ex jockstrap for you, for you academians out there. Only thing, I don't have a PhD. I'm about that far away from one. I need that dissertation. And uh, what tickles me is education really is such a farce. I'm really a, about a 10th grade dropout, and I just had the perseverance to stay in there, and here I am, damn near a PhD, a 10th grade dropout. That kind of tickles me. My mother and father, neither one, got out of high school, went to boarding schools all their life, bootlegged all of his life, he did. Both drank, both were alcoholics at one time, they're not any longer. But it just proves if you want to do something bad enough, you can do it. They quit. And I wanted to get that damn PhD bad enough so I could show some of you Caucasians and I could get up in front of you. You know, about a year ago, I gave a talk in Northern California where they hate Indians. As a matter of fact, in Ukiah, California, they did a survey recently and they found out that the non-Indians living around Ukiah, California think that Indians are inferior biologically, mentally, and physically. This is their assumption of Indian people. And they invited me up to give a talk in Ukiah School District one night. And in giving my talk, I came out with some pretty strong words and what have you. And after I got through, some of the people were really upset. And they called me into a special meeting to ask if I would answer a few questions and what have you, and I did. And one white man who was a teacher there got real upset. And he challenged me on a few of the things that I'd said. So finally I told him, I said, you know what's bugging you? Is you people paid me $200 to come up here and talk to you. And for the things that I said tonight, you would have tarred and feathered my ass and run me out on a rail about 10 years ago, but you paid me $200 for it tonight. And it really upset them. I forget exactly what I'm being paid for this tonight, but whatever it is, it'll be worth it because I'm frustrated. I have an inferiority complex, as all Indians do who come from reservations, but I overcome it by my brash talk 
And instead of getting on the freeway and hawking at people, I just get up in front of audiences and cuss them out and what have you, and you pay me three, four, five, eight hundred dollars for it, and I go home and I laugh all the way home. <laughs> kind of tickles me to think that I can get up and just talk like this and you pay me for it. It's kind of an amazing thing how our society has turned out today. I'm not a damn comedian, but I do tell a few jokes once in a while. For you Indian people out there, I know that uh, you heard the Bureau of Indian Affairs today. I, uh, I assume you did. The Bureau of Indian Affairs. There was a circus train going through Arizona, and they had a wreck, and some of the animals got loose, and they started rounding up all these animals, and they caught them all with the exception of one, a baboon. And they couldn't catch this baboon. And they got word that another train was coming, and they had better pull off and get on their way. So they loaded up the animals that they had, they put them in the train, and they left. Two, three days later, two, three Indians were walking by, and they saw this baboon. And they had never seen one before. They didn't know what it was, so they jumped back behind some mesquite bushes, and they watched it for a while. Finally, one of them says, why don't we capture it, and we'll take it back to the tribe. Said, somebody might know what it is. And they got up their nerve after a while, and they grabbed it. And it struggled, and they drug it, screaming and hollering, all the way back to the tribe. After getting it back there, nobody knew what it was. So finally, the chief, he says, I think I know what it is. He said, what's that? He said, well, judging from the blank expression on its face and the calluses on its ass, it must be a BIA man. <laughs> you non-Indians probably won't understand that. That's Bureau of Indian Affairs. Getting down to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, if the Bureau of Indian Affairs was a private corporation, they would have gone broke and gone bank into bankruptcy the first year of business because they operate in one of the most unconventional standards of any, probably any corporation or any department of the federal government. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is made up over 18,000 people, of which half are non-Indian, half of these 18,000. Now, we lead the nation in unemployment. Our unemployment rates range anywhere from 40 to 90 percent, depending upon which reservation you visit. So they erect a Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they put over half of the people non-Indians. And when you get into the upper echelon of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you find that 89 percent of the top executive positions are non-Indians. And then you get into our Commissioner of Indian Affairs. We don't elect him, Indian people. He's selected by the President and confirmed by the Senate. This year, they went out, when Mr. Nixon and his Republican administration came in, they hunted high and low to find a Republican Indian so they could make a Republican Commissioner of Indian Affairs. They finally found one, Commissioner Bruce, Lewis Bruce, Republican, owns a 600-acre dairy farm in upstate New York, just barely making it. <laughs> they looked under every rock in the country to come up with this dairy farmer. Mr. Bruce, when he first came into office, he, was a very, he is a very wishy-washy person. Incidentally, I know him personally. He's a very good friend. I've learned to like the man. He's done more for the Bureau of Indian Affairs than any commissioner since John Collier. He did something just recently. He did away with what we call area directors, which was a fantastic thing for Indian people. The makeup of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it goes from the reservation level. You have different reservations. And you'll have what they call an area office, which will be over maybe two or three reservations in this area. When, when Indian people gripe on the lower level, it very r rarely gets above what they call the superintendent. Used to be called Indian agents in the old days. Their gripes rarely got above that level. And when they did get above it, it would go to the area director. Well, the superintendent who runs the reservations, he's not about to let the area director know that he's got problems and can't handle himself because it would be a bad mark on his record and he wouldn't get a higher raise in salary. He has aspirations of becoming the next area director. And in turn, the area directors are not about to let Washington, D.C. know that they can't handle their areas because they might be removed. So Indian people on the bottom level, on the reservation level, they don't, the Bureau doesn't respond to them. We don't control the Bureau. White people control it. 89% of the top executive positions, over half the 18,000 employees are non-Indian. And then our commissioners appointed by the President. You know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs operates within the civil service regulations and laws. All of them are civil service employees. And as you know, it's virtually impossible to fire a civil service, em civil service employee. So what happens if you find an employee who's incompetent, 
You can't fire him, you transfer him. And after you've transferred one of these incompetent individuals, he'll soon work his way around from job to job and reservation to reservation, and he might wind up back where he started from. When this happens, the, proce the procedure then is to promote them and give them a raise in salary, to get them completely out of your hair. This is what happened to the ex-commissioner of Indian Affairs, Robert Bennett. He was so damn incompetent, was transferred from job to job, they eventually made the commissioner out of him. <laughs> I was over in Bemidji, Minnesota last year. I gave a talk over there. And they were telling me about this. They had a, what they call a superintendent of their reservation who was extremely bad, incompetent. And they tried for months to get rid of this man. And after a number of months, a lot of letters, protests and so forth, they managed to have him transferred from the Bemidji, Minnesota area, Chippewas. You know what the Bureau of Indian Affairs did with him after finding out he was incompetent and couldn't handle it? They transferred him over to the Sioux in South Dakota, made him the assistant area director with a raise in salary. Possibly a lot of you two years ago read in the papers where the Bureau of Indian Affairs surveyed and did an investigation at Shalaka, Oklahoma, an off-reservation boarding school, which is considered the end of the line for reservation boarding schools. They found that for disciplinary reasons there at Shilako, they were taking young boys and girls and handcuffing them behind their backs and over their heads, over uh, poles and so forth, for eight and 10 uh, and 12 hours at a time for disciplinary they reasons. They found young boys with broken ribs, broken arms, and all kinds of gashes on them where they had been beaten and kicked. Discipline, Bureau of Indian Affairs, discipline. They publi publicized this in the news media. Senator Bedcalf and a few others put it in the news. You know what they did to the superintendent of the school? They jerked he and the principal out for a short period of time and then put him right back after the heat cooled down. And then due to public pressure, he was finally transferred and they made him the assistant area education office director in Oklahoma, a little raise in salary. One of the investigative team asked him what he would do, asked the superintendent, Mr. Wall, they asked him what he would do if given more money, more budget. He said, I'd build a bigger jail and hire more guards. This was one of the superintendents of a Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding school talking about what he would do to young Indian boys and girls. Build a bigger jail. That's nice, isn't it? When you've got people like that. You know, in discussing the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has been around for a long time and they'll probably be around for a much longer time. But the fact is that they're extremely wasteful with your money, my money, because we all pay taxes. And they're taking your money and misusing it on outdated programs. They try to change Indians to fit the needs of their outdated programs, rather than trying to change the programs to fit the needs of the Indian people. This has been their procedure for years, to assimilate Indians, forcefully if possible, if not, any other way they can get them. You know, the first school established in this United States for Indian people was established in 1568 by the Jesuits in Havana, Cuba, for Indians from Florida. For you historians out there, people who are taking notes and what have you. 1568 by the Jesuits, and for the first 300 years, Indian education was not controlled by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We didn't have one. It wasn't controlled by the federal government. It was controlled by the Franciscans, the Jesuits, and the Protestants, the Anglican Church. The Franciscans, they went into Arizona, New Mexico, California, and established a system of missions in which they would take Indian families and put them in these missions and use them as slave laborers. They worked six days a week and prayed on Sunday. And they used them to feed the Spanish garrisons they had out there. And once you went into these religious institutions, these missions, you never got away. About half of the Indian people died from diseases, old world diseases. You know, they say that Indians sprang from Asian stock. That may be true. They say we came across the Bering Strait and that we're former Asians. That may be so. But Indians lack what they call the B factor in their blood which gives you immunity to old world diseases. And yet Asians have the B factor and they're immune to it. We're very susceptible to respiratory diseases, diphtheria, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, 
and what have you. Our people died off like flies in the early years when you people first came over here, you squatters. You're still squatting on every damn thing you get your hands on. And I said you're like seagulls. You turn around and you put our people in these missions, you Franciscans, you the Spanish, who were, the Franciscans were mainly of Spanish origin. They set up a series of 21 missions in California alone. They killed off approximately 90,000 Indians in a period of about 50 to 60 years through disease, brutality, emotional genocide. The federal government has committed religious genocide, cultural genocide, and physical genocide against American Indians. And then your Jesuits, they came in from Quebec, down through the St. Lawrence River, down in the Great Lakes. They settled army posts all up and down the Mississippi River. They're French. They separated the women and the children and the men. They took the children and separated them from the families so they could get them away from their people and further acculturate them, teach them French, teach them the Jesuit language, or Jesuit religion and so forth. And then came your Anglicans, your English, which I imagine most of you are. You know, your French, there was, there was a tremendous amount of intermarriage between French and Indians. A lot of intermarriage between Spanish and Indians. But English, no. Very standoffish. They wanted to trade furs and metal objects and so forth with Indians. They were willing to take our food, our cotton and our tobacco and other products they could export, take our land, kill off our people, commit religious, physical, and cultural genocide, but they didn't like to intermarry too much. This is something that is still kind of a carryover today, I think. You find a tremendous amount of intermarriage. That's why Mexicans in Mexico are half Indian and half Spanish. And that's why you see a lot of Indians in Canada, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, with French names, Lebo, Lacamp, Duchesneau, and what have you, all these French. They did intermarry. I'm not here to praise the French or the Spanish and say that the English are bad. None of them are doing any damn thing for us. They came over here to exploit people, Indian people, hunting religious converts. I'm not a Christian. I don't, I don't condemn religion. I think religion is great. It's just too damn bad. Most, most of you white people don't believe in it. You brought it over here. You ought to believe in it. It's something that, you know, they say there's never been any religious persecution in this country. Did you know that in 1884, the federal government enacted laws forbidding Indians to worship as they please? And these laws were enriched in 1904, and they lasted until 1933, that Indians couldn't worship as they please. And they branded Indian religion as pagan. Lasted till 1933. How about that? That's not too many years ago. 1933, Indians couldn't worship. You know what they did? After Indians were conquered, you didn't conquer us by sheer force of numbers. You conquered us by starvation. Through your Jesuits, your Franciscans, and your English, you, co you colonized the New England coast, from Canada all the way down to Florida. And you eventually began spreading westward. First, you put up the Appalachian Mountains as the first barrier. You pushed Indians beyond that. And then as you begin encroaching more upon our people and signing more treaties and what have you, you then set the Mississippi River as the next boundary line. And in 1830, you passed what they call the Indian Removal Act, where you decided you would remove all Indians east of the Mississippi and put them west of the Mississippi. And you bought their land, and some of it you exchanged equal amount that they had here on the eastern side of the Mississippi to an equal amount on the western side. Andrew Jackson, good old Andrew Jackson, famous president, came in and passed the Indian Removal Act under his administration. Have you ever read about the Trail of Tears? The Trail of Tears? I'm sure that many of you haven't because they don't put it in your damn history books. The Trail of Tears, they rounded up the Cherokee like dogs, animals, they rounded them up. And they kept them in pins, concentration camps there, until they rounded more all they could. Some of them escaped into the hills, some of the Cherokees. And after they got them in the dead of winter, they started marching them northward over to Oklahoma. They marched them in the dead of winter, old people who could just barely walk, carrying their major belongings. Women carrying their children and what they could carry on their back. Some of them were ill-clothed, no shoes and they marched them till they dropped and bayoneted them. It was worse than a Bataan death march. 
13,000 Indians died in this march. 13,000. They marched them right through. A Russian writer came over and he said it was one of the most despicable things he'd ever witnessed. Old people marching till they'd fall from exhaustion and they'd kick them off the side of the road, let them freeze to death, let them starve. They marched them into Oklahoma where they now remain the major part of the Cherokees and you still have some down in Cherokee, North Carolina. And incidentally, in Cherokee, North Carolina, they have 28 churches in a five mile radius. The Christians moved in. 28 churches within a five mile radius. That's pretty good. Now, damn, they must have one on about every block. They've been saving our souls now for so long, it's time you white people tried saving our bodies. That might do a little more. Maybe that's the reason we're leading the nation in unemployment. Maybe that's the reason the average Indian dies at 42 years of age compared to 68 for non-Indians. Maybe that's the reason we have a suicide rate that's 100 times the national average on the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. Maybe that's the reason that one out of every five reservation Indians comes down with what they call otitis media, which is a middle ear infection. One out of every five Indians comes down with this, causing either deafness or an empiring of the hearing. Maybe that's the reason that our infant mortality rate is two times the national average. The TB rate for Indians is seven and eight times greater than the dominant white population. We have two eye diseases on reservations that are almost unheard of in the dominant white population, glaucoma and trachoma, causing either blindness or an, either they obstruct your view. You either come down with an empowering of your view. It's almost unheard of, both of these diseases off. And last year, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had one full-time psychologist for the entire Bureau of Indian Affairs school system. One full-time psychologist. You know, Indian people lead the nation in bad health. The average Indian has a fifth grade education in this country. The fifth grade is the average educational level of attainment in this country. And dropout rates are the worst in the nation. They range anywhere from 40 to 100%, depending upon which reservation you visit. Last year I was in Michigan giving a talk and I talked to some Indian people who told me they had their first Indian to graduate from a high school since anybody can remember. Since anybody can remember. And they've got some high schools in Oregon that Indians haven't graduated in five years or longer. They don't teach Indian history and Indian culture, Indian languages. Indian arts and crafts on Indian reservations. They teach the same curriculum that they teach in the public schools. The curriculum that's formed in the dominant white middle class society is transposed over to an Indian reservation and taught to Indian people. And over 50% of the Indian youth in this country don't speak English. English is a foreign language to them. And when they tar start to school, they try forcing English on them. In the old days, they used to give our young children demerits if they caught them speaking English. And you work off the demerits by uh, so many hours for each of work for each demerit. Now this is a very sad thing to talk about Indian education, Indian, Indian religion, to talk about Indian health and so forth. It's the worst in the nation. And this is the strongest country the world has ever known. The strongest country and the richest country the world has ever known. And yet we can't take care of 600,000 Indians. 600,000, and there's only about 400,000 that live on reservations. Did you ever stop and think that if we can't take care of 400,000 Indians, how in the hell are we gonna take care of 22 million blacks and all these other minorities we've got? Give you a little something to think about. You know, in studying the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I was on the Navajo reservation about four months ago and I gave a talk at Window Rock, Arizona among the Navajos. And they were telling me about their trading post system they have there. For your information, trading posts, in 1834, Congress passed what they call the Trade and Intercourse Act, the Trade and Intercourse Act, whereby the Commissioner of Indian Affairs could appoint and give licenses to traders, white traders, to come on to Indian reservations and sell goods. In issuing licenses to these people, he could regulate the prices on the items they sold, the kind of, the kind of goods they sold, and the quality. And that's what he's supposed to do, to make sure Indians aren't fleeced. Well, on the Navajo reservation, they have approximately 100 trading posts. That's the largest reservation in the United States. 
approximately 25,000 square miles, over 150,000 Indians. Largest reservation and the largest tribe of Indians in the United States. And they've got 100 trading posts. You can't buy products any place except at the trading post unless you leave the reservation. Because you can't just run down to the supermarket, to the local store, the local drugstore and what have you. There aren't any. You go to the trading post. And there's no competition. They regulate prices the same. Five dollars for a carton of cigarettes on a Navajo reservation. Two dollars and a half for a dozen eggs. They charge two dollars and eighty-five cents for a one-pound can of coffee that costs the trader seventy-eight cents. These people, over half the Navajos are functionally illiterate. They don't speak or read and write English. They have the highest unemployment rates of any tribe of Indians in the United States. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs runs trading posts for these people, and they let these white traders come in and fleece them. These traders, they take their welfare checks. Many of these old people can't read or write, so they take them and put a thumbprint on their check. And they take their check and deposit it against their account. Some give them what they call script, a make-believe money they can only trade at that individual trading post. They buy their wool, and they buy their cattle and so forth at the prices they set. Most of these people don't have cars. They can't leave the reservation to go into their urban areas to buy any food, clothing, and so forth. So they have to buy at the trading posts, and they raise the prices outrageously high. They also act as a post office, and they open the mail so they can find out exactly how much your check is for, your welfare check, and so forth. They know, and they give you just enough credit to cover your check. Do you think the Bureau of Indian Affairs would go out and make sure that these people aren't fleeced? They had cases where women were actually physically abused to get the money. It's unbelievable how the Bureau of Indian Affairs can let a bunch of trading posts like this misuse a bunch of poor Indians such as this. It's kind of disgraceful. 100 trading posts. They averaged last year. The makeup, the markup rather I should say, was between 30 and 100 percent on the foods. And last year, these 100 trading posts averaged $20 million annually off of Indian people. That's like robbing the blind, taking money from people who can't read and write. It's like saying, yeah, I know the poker game is crooked, but it's the only one in town. Well, that's the way it is there. On my reservation at Cheyenne Agency, South Dakota, I went in there and I went to the local trading posts and they sell butternut coffee. You ever heard of butternut coffee? I heard of Folgers and Mrs. Uh, Olson on TV, but I never heard of butternut coffee. Well, that's the only kind of coffee they had. If you want to buy coffee, you don't buy anything but butternut, and it's outrageously high. And then they employ Indian people to do beadwork. I went to the Wounded Knee Trading Post in South Dakota, and at the Wounded Knee Trading Post, I bought a pair of beaded moxins year before last when I went through there. It cost me $50. I put them in my car, went around to get a drink of water a little bit later, around, and I saw a hydrant in back, or a well, rather, I should say. Walked around, and there was some old Indian woman doing beadwork. They were paying her 50 cents an hour. 50 cents an hour. She could knock out a pair of beaded moccasins in a couple days or so. 50, now the price is up to 50, 75, and $100, depending on the color of them and what have you. It's amazing how the Bureau of Indian Affairs will let people, will let non-Indians run over our Indian people. You know, when you start looking into Indian education and you say, well, why does the average Indian only have a fifth grade education when one third of the budget from the Bureau of Indian Affairs goes for education? One third. Did you know that last year, year before last, when a Robert Kennedy headed a Senate subcommittee hearing to investigate Indian education, they came up with some very startling figures, and they labeled Indian education a national disgrace. A national disgrace, he said. Something had to be done. Indians would drop out rates from 40 to 100 percent. 
average Indian having a fifth grade education. They found out that only 16% of the teachers who teach Indian are, are of Indian extraction. And 25% of the teachers who teach Indians don't like teaching Indians. They don't like teaching Indians. They don't teach Indian history and culture in these reservations. You go into a typical Indian reservation school, and when you walk in, you see a white man's name on there. Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, George Custer, that sexy Vietnam psychopathic killer. I said this on a TV program in San Francisco, and I had about 500 phone calls wanted to assassinate me, because I call their Custer a sex deviant and a psychopathic killer. And they asked me how I knew he was a sex deviant. I said, well, it's common knowledge among Sioux Indians and Cheyenne Indians. And some woman called up and she said, I can't take your word for it. Do you have any proof? And I said, well, do you have any proof he isn't? I've got 40,000 Sioux, and I don't know how many Cheyenne Indians there are in this country. And they think Custer's a sex deviant. That's good enough for me. She said, well, you have to, do you have anything in writing, any written proof? And I said, no, he didn't sign any affidavit saying he was a damn sex deviant, I don't think. <laughs> But nevertheless, you Caucasians are very reluctant to accept the word of an Indian. In fact, you don't accept the word of a, to many people. You know, last, I've got a cousin who has a BA degree. He was teaching on my home reservation in South Dakota. And he went into Rapid City to buy a car. And his wife was teaching, both of them teaching for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And you know, they wouldn't sell him a car in Rapid City because he was an Indian. They were worried about his credit. He had the down payment but they were afraid he might take the car and go back to the reservation. Because see, on most reservations, only federal law and Indian law pertains. And they were thinking he might take the car and abscond to the reservation and not make any payments on it. Can you imagine that, a college graduate, and they're not gonna sell him a car. He finally went to another city and put enough down payment down on one that he, they did manage to take his money. But that's bad when they won't take your money because you're an Indian. Kind of gets you, doesn't it? Right in a pocketbook. Those old traders in the Navajo Reservation charging $5 for a carton of cigarettes. You know, they ought to have a little Indian power around there. Talking about the Boston Tea Party, they ought to have a damn trader party around there. Do a little burning or dumping some of those goods into the ocean there. They don't have any damn ocean, but they could run those damn traders off. What I'm saying is Indian people should set up their own co-ops. And if these crooked tribal leaders we've got on some of these reservations would allow something like this and try to help their people rather than fleece them and stuff their own pockets. They'd set up tribal co-ops for Indian people so they could have co-ops and sell people food, clothing, and any other type of merchandise they wanted at reasonable rates. And if the Bureau of Indian Affairs really tried to help Indians, they would stamp out these crooked traders and make sure they had prices that they could afford instead of trying to make their living fleecing these people. You know, I want to go into just a bit of history. I started about three times and got completely off. Up until 1865, when the Civil War was over, the United States, the outs outside, outer, proportions of the, outer portions of the United States were along the eastern seaboard, along the southern, northern, and the western seaboard were all colonized. And they were all hemmed in. And your Indians, your Plains Indians in the central portion of the United States, they were relatively untouched by non-Indians up until the Civil War was over. You people were so busy fighting each other for about four years that you didn't actually bother around killing many Indians, attacking us, what have you. You were attacking each other. Well, when the Civil War was over in 1865, all of a sudden there was a vast new area to cover, the Plains area, occupied by a bunch of Plains Indians, all the way from Canada down to Texas from the Mississippi River over till you get into the Rocky Mountains. A big, vast area occupied by Plains Indians. This was considered sort of a vast desert up to this area. So when the Civil War was over, you had millions of men standing around, nothing to do, no place to go. So they sicked them on the Plains Indians, the last of the Indians to give up. And that's why you read about so many Plains Indians, and you see so many movies, television scripts about the Plains Indians is because they were the last to give up, relatively untouched. The rest of the Indians had been conquered up till the Civil War was over. Well, in conquering the Plains Indians, it was a much harder task than they had anticipated because they had acquired horses from the Spanish and they'd become competent horsemen. They say that the Comanche Indians set back civilization in the Southwest 100 years. Fantastic cavalry, light cavalry. 
Indians were the greatest fighters pound for pound in the world. They didn't have to carry a large amount of food with them, supply trains and so forth. They lived off the land. Well, when they started trying to, trying to capture, colonize, and to conquer the Plains Indians, as I said, it became a much bigger task than they anticipated. They found out that it, it was extremely hard. The only way they could do it was to starve them into submission. So they advocated killing the buffalo wolf, buffalo hats, buffalo coats, and so forth. Kill them for the meat. Kill them and take the tongue. Take a few delicacies and so forth. And this is what they did. They enticed people to come from Europe to come over on vast hunting expeditions, see how many they could kill in one day. It was a big sport, setting off on a hill and shooting downwind from Buffalo and see how many could kill in an hour, how many could kill in a day, a thousand a day, two thousand a day. There were over 50 million buffalo roaming the plains area, and the Indians followed them in a migratory, their migratory path, killing what they needed. They didn't pollute the damn rivers, the streams, the air. They just existed. To some of you people, that probably seems like a very simple way of life. It was, but they existed. They were happy. They didn't have all these damn complexes you people do today. In fact, all of us do. They were just existing. And you know, when you stop and think about it, it doesn't matter. We're all born equal. You come in naked, and you go out with nothing. You can't take anything with you. I guess you can make life a little better by becoming wealthy. You can make a better home for yourself and a better way of life while you're here, but you still go out with nothing. And Indians had a very simple way of life. They had a religion, culture, heritage, and they believed in helping people. So all of a sudden, they start a mass slaughter of the buffalo. And in slaughtering the buffalo, they were able to then starve Indians into submission, force them to sign treaties where they would give up their vast hunting areas and come onto small enclosed areas called reservations, which were really concentration camps in the early days. Because you couldn't come and go from a reservation. Once they cornered you up, they took your weapons away from you. They took your horses, and you were confined to this area. You couldn't even go from one part of a reservation to another without a pass. And you know, when you can find two, three, eight, ten thousand Indians in a small enclosed area, you soon kill off the small game, rabbits, quail, pheasant, and so forth. And you're dependent upon your captures, your captors then, to feed you. And they used to come around and issue monthly food supplies. They'd kill, come in with so many beef and kill them and divide the beef up between the Indians. And they even used this. Did you know that the Congress passed a law authorizing the Secretary of Interior to withdraw food rations from any Indian parents who wouldn't send their children to school? Talking about compulsory school attendance, man, as you white people say, man, or you blacks and whites say, man, god damn, that's really something. When you withdraw food from somebody after you've conquered them and placed them in reservations and you withdraw their food unless they forswear their religion, unless they forswear their culture, this is too much. And if they don't send their children to your schools, you withdraw their food. This is all true. Read John Collier's Indians of the Americas. He mentions a lot of this stuff in a little paperback by the former Indian commissioner, a white man, John Collier. This will do you people good to do some reading. Some of you historians, read something besides Columbus discovered America. That ain't a goddamn laugh. That lost Italian discovered America. 100,000 Indians here, and he suddenly discovered us. <laughs> yeah, that tickles me. Some of us call ourselves Native Americans rather than the term Indian, because the term Indian was given to us by a white man. As a matter of fact, a lost white man. You might say some dumb honky who thought he landed in India. And, uh, Kind of. I noticed we had some Indians standing out here from H India. No offense, just brothers, huh? And, uh, <laughs> hunting for that quick route to India, to the Asia, or whatever you there. After they conquered our people, and they placed us in these concentration camps called reservations, and we were dependent upon food handed out by the federal government, that's when they passed the laws in 1884, forbidding Indians to worship as they please. They enriched them in 1904, and they lasted until 1933. They then found out, after placing us in these concentration camps, that even to assimilate us wasn't an easy task. We had our religions, Indian religion. Indians believed in many gods, sun, wind, the moon, but they had one supreme being, and that's the whole ball of wax. 
one supreme being. You Catholics, you don't believe in, you don't believe in contraceptives or anything, you know, you, uh, you Baptists, you don't believe in dancing and kissing. Can't eat meat on Friday, you Catholics and all this. What the hell would have happened to the Indians when meat was a staple food supply if they couldn't have eaten meat on Friday? No dancing, which was a major thing in our lives. Victory dancers, defeat dancers, any damn thing else. Dancing was a part of our life. I get a big kick out of Christianity. They tell Indians, you've got to become a Christian and be saved in order to go to heaven. I sometimes wonder what the hell happened to all those Indians who died before coming in contact with you white people. They all going to go to hell? Christ must have been a white man. I think God and Christianity and white people all came over on the same boat. And they got here at the same time. You people believe uh, you have to worship in a set place. You set a set building over. You got to worship there. And you got to hire some intermediary to communicate with God for you. And then you pay him. And he gets you out of purgatory. You die, you go to purgatory. And he has to buy, you have to buy your way out. Indians worshiped any time they wanted to, any time of the day. They didn't have to have a set place to worship, pay some intermediary to communicate with God for them. And they worshiped any time they wanted to. Very simple way of life, just worshiping God, believing and helping your man, fellow man. We didn't have welfare payments, long welfare lines, nut houses, mother scores. We took care of our own. And I'm not downgrading religion Religion is a good thing. I'm just saying you don't force Christianity on Indian kids, and that's essentially what has been done. Religious genocide. After they got our young kids, our people in these reservations, they found out the only way they could truly conquer Indians after they got us into submission was to strike at the core of the Indian way of life, the youth. They had to break up tribal societies, do away with our, our true hereditary leaders, so that what they did, if they couldn't find a chief who would go along with them and be what we call an apple today, who's an Indian who's red on the outside and white on the inside, or some sellout or hang around a fort Indian. In the old days, some of the Indians used to give up and come and hang around the forts and beg for food with white people instead of getting out there goddamn fighting them. Well, what happened, they decided to strike at the core. They took our youth and they set up off-reservation boarding schools. And they took Indian children to the age of five and six and forcefully took them away from their parents and put them in off-reservation boarding schools. A little history, the first off-reservation boarding school was Hampton Negro Military Institute for Indian children. In Virginia, it's located. A man by the name of Captain Pratt, who was in charge of a Negro cavalry unit during the Civil War, suddenly became fascinated by Indians. And after the Civil War was over, and they started their campaign in full against the Indian people, well, they conquered a few Indians, and when they would conquer them, they'd take prisoners, and they shipped them off to St. Augustine, Florida, and kept them there for a number of years in captivity. And Captain Pratt, who had been in charge of a Negro cavalry unit, decided that Indians could be educated. So what did he do? He got a bunch of rich white people and asked them if they would sponsor Indian kids in some of the different schools only thing, no schools would take them. There was only one school that would accept them, Hampton Negro Military Institute, set up especially for blacks. They took them. This was in 1878. And at Hampton, they had what they call an outing system, where during the summer months, they would send them out to white farmers and further give them practical experience in farming. A bunch of Quakers teaching the Quaker religion. Depending upon which religious order had entrenched itself within these different off-reservation boarding schools, that's what our Indian kids came out. If the Catholics were in this one, they became Catholics. If the Presbyterians were over here, they became Presbyterians. So they sent them to Carlisle in 1878, the first year. And then the next year, in 1879, they erected the first Indian off-reservation boarding school at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, called Carlisle Institute which is probably famous to some of you people because you may have seen the Jim Thorpe movie. Jim Thorpe was the greatest athlete who ever lived, barring whether you're white, black, brown, or what. He won the decathlon, the pentathlon, in the Olympic Games, which is something that has never been duplicated since. He played professional baseball, was a great baseball player, 
John McGraw told him to bunt and he had a home run and they fired him. He was the first big time professional football player. He made professional football today. He was the first big time player. He was one of these rare individuals who comes around, no matter what color you are, who comes around once in a lifetime, once every hundred years or so. You've had great men in football, basketball, track, or what have you, but here was a man who was, who was put together so he could do all of these. Well, he went to Carlisle. And you know what? Carlisle was only a high school, and they were playing major colleges. And they defeated major colleges in football and track all across the country. My father went to one of these off-reservation boarding schools at Haskell Institute in Kansas. And he used to tell me when I was a little kid he wanted me to be Jim Thorpe. And I grew up trying to be Jim Thorpe. I wasn't good enough to carry Jim Thorpe's football shoes out to the damn football field. But he got me through college and he got me through high school because I wanted to be Jim Thorpe. I wanted to do something to please my father. And that's what got me through, playing football. I wanted to be Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe at that time was probably the idol of every Indian in the United States. I was reading about Jim Thorpe when they had a track meet one time. Pop Warner, who was a coach of Carlisle Indian School at that time, took Jim Thorpe and one other little Indian, about this big, took him to a track meet. And when he got to this town, this big college town, the uh, coach came out and met him, the opposite coach, and said, well, where's your track team? And he said, uh, right there. Jim Thorpe and this other little scroungy Indian there, about that big, little desert Indian. <laughs> Jim Thorpe won the 50-yard dash, the 100-yard dash, the 220. He won the shot put, the broad jump, the javelin, and a discus, and the 440-yard dash. And this little scroungy Indian won the mile, the two mile, and right on up. And they won the track meet, two of them. <laughs> How's that for two Indians? You white people had them surrounded, didn't they? You know, when I read about things like that, that thrills me from a damn tip of my toes up to my head because I'm very pro-Indian, and we've got so damn little to be proud about today, the way we've been conquered and pushed around and shoved around, debased and what have you. And to read about somebody great like that who was untouchable, no matter what they did to him, he was still the greatest athlete who ever lived, and you can't take it away from him. They did take his medals away from him that he won in the Olympics because they said he played semi-pro baseball one summer for his room and board. They took his medals away and still haven't given them back. <laughs> My mother and father used to tell me when they went to Haskell that during the football games there that Jim Thorpe had another big Indian by the name of John Levi who made All-American. He could throw a football 100 yards in the air. And he went to Haskell, John Levi, another high school, and they played big time colleges and he made All-American. And at halftime, Jim Thorpe would kick the ball to John Levi and he'd catch it and Levi would throw it back and they'd back up five yards a whack until they were on opposite ends of the field. And Thorpe would kick it to Levi, and Levi would catch it, and he'd throw it back. Not every time could they kick it 100 yards or throw it 100 yards, but they could throw it and kick it 100. That's a fantastic feat to see two great men like that. John Levi weighed about 230 pounds, stood about six foot four, giant of a man for the 1920s. This is something that young Indians need to see today. Indian greats like this, who aren't afraid to stand up in front of a bunch of white people or any other people, and they need to see them doing something, doctors, lawyers, engineers. Look at the blacks. Hell, if you want a Willie Mays. Sidney Poitier won the Oscar recently. No matter what field you point to, the blacks can point to somebody and say, we got somebody there. I'd like to be like him. Who can the Indians point to? Billy Mills, he won a 10,000 meter race at the last Olympics. Before last, what I should say. We can't all be track men, and Jim Thorpe is long gone. Our young people can't relate to him today. And we need new heroes, new images for Indian people to look up to, to build ourselves up. Because we're seeking self-determination, the right to run our own affairs and direct our own destiny. And this is what we're seeking. You know, it's an insult for an Indian to go to a reservation and have a bunch of white people telling him what to do a white superintendent of the reservation, a white education officer, a white relocation officer, a white loan officer, a white land officer, and what have you. To me, that's a goddamn insult to my intelligence. I don't have anything against white people. You people have a right to be here, I guess. You conquered us. I don't hate white people. I just hate what white people have done to Indians. 
And I think any Indian who sits around and is satisfied with his lot in life ought to have his ass kicked. The only good Indian's a mad Indian. And will be damn mad about what's happened to us. And not try to take back this country by rebellion or what have you. We're not going to take anything back by violence. But we're going to have to start getting educations and become Indian lawyers and doctors and engineers and go back and help our people. Well, this is something we're going to have to do. Stop fighting each other. You know, I formed a national Indian organization in 1968. It's called United Native Americans, UNA. It's today possibly the largest Indian organization in the United States. We're not funded by anybody. No federal agency or private organization funds us. We exist solely by the sale of our newspaper we publish called Warpath. Bumper stickers and buttons and so forth that we sell, posters. I sent off to the Smithsonian Institute and I got a bunch of posters of Geronimo, of Gaul, who led the Custer battle, he and Crazy Horse. And I sent off and got others, famous men like Red Cloud, Red Shirt, Chief Joseph, and we made them into big posters about three foot long and two foot wide so we can give our young Indians a chance to see who their heroes were, their great leaders were in the past. And I brought them here. They're in my car out there. I wish I'd have brought them in because I've got them for sale. I want some of you non-Indians to see who our great people were. And we've got little buttons that say Indian power and bumper stickers that say Indian power. Custer had it coming. <laughs> and Indians discovered America. These are something that it gives our youth something to grasp at. They can see it and feel it. It's tangible. They're striving for self-determination. It gives them a little oomph. And I brought these. This Indian organization I formed in 1968 is called a militant organization. I'm not a communist or a socialist. I don't advocate violence. I'm a registered Democrat. Well, you see I agents out there and the other damn people who are running around investigating. I know you're here someplace, doesn't matter. You know, they can arrest you now for going from crossing a state line to speak and you might incite a riot. And I don't want to be picked up on this. And so if there's a damn riot that breaks out while I'm here, I am leaving. <laughs> and you should know that. I gotta get me on some trumped up charge. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today you have heard the first of a two-part program featuring a lecture by Lehman Brightman. Mr. Brightman is the head of Native American Studies at the University of California at Berkeley and president of United Native Americans. His topic is Alternatives to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Part two of Mr. Brightman's lecture can be heard next week at this same time. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.